Thank you, Dr. Bacote. Um, Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. May we pray. Gracious God, your word, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else, in Jesus' name, amen. Living between expectation and experience. Living between expectation and experience. Paul writes this from jail. Paul is in prison when he pens these famous words that we rehearse in difficult moments. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. But it certainly was not Paul's expectation that prison was part of his destiny. I imagine Paul growing up, the son of a Pharisee, part of the tribe of Benjamin, looking at his father and other members of the family as occupying places of leadership where he would someday be as well. I imagine Paul sitting at the feet of Gamaliel, learning his lessons in such a way that at some point in his life he will become a teacher just like the noted scholar. His expectations were for greatness. His expectations were for success. His expectations were for religious zealotries on behalf of the Jewish population. But his experience is jail. There's a gap between expectation and experience. You think it's going one way, but it ends up going another. You, you have high hopes, but you find yourself in the valley. There's a gap between expectations and experience, and if you don't believe me, ask anyone who's been married. <laughs> because on the day you say, I do, you have great expectations, but somewhere along the line, the married person says, if I knew then, what I know now, I never would have said I do. I'd have said I don't. <laughs> There's a gap. In the ministry God has given me, I encounter that gap all the time because everyone who's incarcerated is living in that gap. Having experienced incarceration myself, all the degrees, all of the accolades, those were part of the expectation, but then my experience was number 10002648, George W. Hill Correctional Facility, Delaware County, Pennsylvania. There's a gap. And one of the problems with the gap is we haven't learned how to deal with the gap. We look at people who are incarcerated as inferior. We define them in light of the worst thing they've ever done. We make them subhuman. We don't want to consider them as being children of God. We don't want to consider them as being created in the image of God. There's a stigma our society has given to the incarcerated, and even though Paul was incarcerated for righteousness sake, were he incarcerated today, he would bear the same stigma. And he would have to struggle with the gap between expectation and experience piled on by the stigmatization of society and the church. I had a student once who told me she wasn't called to prison ministry. And I really thought that was strange because there's nothing in the Bible about prison ministry. It's just the, the church taking care of prisoners. But she says, I, I just can't deal with inmates. She had bought into the stigma of people incarcerated being something less than human. She said, I just, I just can't deal with the thought of being around an inmate. I said, well, then can I borrow your Bible? She said, why? I said, well, this is seminary. And the job of seminary is to destroy your confidence in the Bible and take stuff out. So let me take some things out and make you feel better. She said, what are you going to take out? I said, first, I'm going to take out the book of Genesis because Joseph was an inmate. 
Then I have to take out the book of Jeremiah because Jeremiah was in solitary confinement. Then we have to get rid of the book of Daniel because Daniel was a two-time loser and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were on death row. If you can't deal with inmates, we got to get rid of the book of Revelation because John wrote that while he was locked up. If you can't deal with inmates, we got to get rid of First and Second Peter because Peter was locked up. The church prayed for him all night long, but when he came home with early release, the church wouldn't let him in. If you can't deal with inmates, you can't tell the story of John the Baptist. If you can't deal with inmates, you can't talk about Paul. Because when he wrote, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, he was an inmate. Now, a good Christian brother came up to correct me one day and he said, you know, there's a difference between people who do the wrong things and get locked up and people that you mentioned. We're talking about people who do the wrong things. I said, you mean like the man who was walking down the street one day and saw one of his friends being beaten up by his boss and he jumped in the middle and killed the boss? He said, yeah, that's the kind of guy you lock up. I said, you just locked up Moses. You mean the musician who one day saw a beautiful woman and you know, you musicians can get quite, quite emotional. And this musician was so moved that he said, I'm going to write a new song about this woman. The Lord is my shepherd. I see what I want. <laughs> Who is that? Her name is Bathsheba. Oh, I got to meet Miss Bathsheba. No, no, she's got a husband. He's in the service. Well, we can arrange a little accident for Mr. Service Man. Today we call that conspiracy to commit murder. You call that musician David. That's a felon. Paul would have gotten an accessory charge for holding the coats when they killed Stephen. Peter would have gotten a felony charge for cutting off the ear of the law enforcement agent. And Jesus had not only compassion for Peter, but he had compassion for the victim. Victims whose voices are seldom heard. Victims whose trust have been violated. Victims who feel invisible in the whole process. And Jesus heals the ear of the victim. So there's good news for the victim. There's good news for the inmate. Because neither of them expected this. Neither of them charted this out. Nobody looks at a baby at their, at their dedication and says, one day you're going to be a victim. One day you're going to be an inmate. Both of them experience the gap between expectation and experience. And so, Paul, how do you handle that gap? How do you live in that space? He says, I have been given the power. I have been given the ability to live in that space through the one who strengthens me. And that's the key to understanding verse 13. I can do all things through him, through Christ who strengthens me. Now see, the, one of the reasons we don't understand that that's what that verse is for is we've made it do other things. We've taken that verse and made it a blank check on doing whatever it is you want in the name of Jesus. You can pass a test in the name of Jesus because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No, no, you need to study. You can study through Christ who strengthens me and then pass the test through Christ who strengthens me. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean you get a blank check. I just flew out here yesterday on the plane. It, there's no blank check in this verse. If it was, the pilot could have come on. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your pilot speaking. I've never flown a plane before, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. <laughs> You get off the plane. <laughs> You're lying on the surgery gurney. And the surgeon comes out and says, I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV. And I have the surgery anointing, hallelujah. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You get up off the table. It's not a blank check verse. In fact, one of the keys to the verse is coping with this gap between expectation and experience. Paul doesn't just say, I can do all things. He says, I have learned. 
I've been through some things. You're going through something right now. I've been through some things. I, I've been at the peak, and I've been in the valley. I've had plenty. I've had nothing. And God has taught me through all of those experiences that his power gives me the ability to live in that gap. And so though I am incarcerated, and though you may look at me as something less than human, or though I am a victim, and though you may look at me as something less than perfect, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can handle it. The challenge in looking at the inmate and in looking at the victim is in understanding that because of Christ, the story's not over. I'm old enough to remember when you couldn't take a picture. I know you're wondering what I mean by that. I, t I can take a picture. I've got a smartphone. I can take a picture. When I was growing up, you couldn't take a picture. You had to take 12 pictures, or 24 pictures, or 36 pictures, because you couldn't take a picture. You had to take all the pictures on the roll of film. And then after you took your 12 pictures on the roll of film, you would take the roll out and walk down to the drugstore and give it to the person behind the counter, and they would send it off someplace to be developed. And then a week later, they would call you, and you would go back and pick up your pictures, and they'd be in an envelope, and you'd have 12 or 24 or 48. You couldn't just take a picture until along came a man named John Land. And John Land invented a camera called a Polaroid. And this Polaroid was a camera where you could take a picture and then you would take the film off the back of the camera, and then you'd shake it up and down. Ask your parents about this. Ask your parents, what does this have to do with taking pictures, Mom? And they'll say, oh, it's the Polaroid. <laughs> and if you shook it for about a minute and a half, you had that moment frozen in time. You could take a picture just like you can with your cell phone. You can freeze this moment in time. The problem with dealing with inmates is we look at them like they're a Polaroid. We freeze them at this moment in time and define them in light of the Polaroid. But God is not a Polaroid God. God's got a DVD, and he has a beginning and an ending for that life. And so we can never define a human being by the worst thing they've ever done. We have to look at them through the lens of God, which has a whole DVD. When children are born, no one expects that one day they're going to commit a crime. I know that I was reading about one inmate the other day, and when he was born, nobody knew that one day he would be an inmate. In fact, when he was born, angels began singing glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Nobody knew that one day he would be an inmate. When he was born, shepherds left their flocks by night and came to see what miracle God had done. Nobody knew that one day he would be an inmate. When he was born, wise men came from the east bringing gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Nobody knew that one day he would be an inmate. Nobody knew he would be an inmate the day that at the age of 12 he was reasoning in the temple with scholars showing wisdom beyond his years. When he healed a young, a young girl who had died, nobody knew he was going to be an inmate. When he took a little boy's filet of fish sandwich and turned it into a whole McDonald's, nobody knew that one day he would be an inmate. But on a Thursday, he was taken into custody. And while he was the in, in custody of the Roman penal system, he was executed. But on the third day, he got early release. And because of the early release of Jesus the felon, you got early release from sin. Because of the early release of Jesus the convict, you got early release from your habits, from your sickness, from your trouble. How do you deal with that gap between expectation and experience? Through the strength of the ex-con who died for your sins, and that's how Paul lived in that gap. And so here you are living in this gap. I want to close by doing something, and I've gotten permission to do this. If you feel yourself living in that gap, specifically around the issue of incarceration, you know someone who's been locked up, you have a family member who's been locked up, you know somebody if they have a parent, 
I'm going to ask you to stand so we can pray. There's no need to be shamed. I gave you my inmate number, so I already told you mine. Your turn. Don't be shamed. Don't be shamed. Because this is, this is personal for you. This is personal for you. It impacts all of us. And, 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 and those of you that, that aren't standing, you can look around. You've got friends who are dealing with this gap. They need your support. They need your help. Some of us have been victims. Others of us have been locked up. But all of us are effective. It's everybody's issue. We're all living in that gap. And so I'm going to pray for those that are standing right now and also for the rest of us, and then we'll be dismissed. Lord, what a difficult gap. We never expected incarceration to touch our lives like this. We never expected crime to touch our lives like this. We never expected victimization to touch our lives like this. But Paul, who was both victim and offender, told us that we can live in this gap through Christ who strengthens us. And Lord, we know that we need our friends that are sitting around us to support us as well. Paul wrote these words to the Philippians who were not ashamed of the fact that he was in jail. They sent him gifts and support while he was locked up. And he thanked them and said, because you have taken care of me while I'm in prison, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. And so those that are standing need those who are sitting. Empower us to shake off the shame, to say no to the stigma, and live in your strength while in that gap between expectation and experience. And most of all, God, we thank you that you are not a Polaroid God and that the moments of our pain are not frozen in eternity. But you are the God of the DVD who has not given up on any inmate or any victim nor have you turned your back on their families, for we stand here today in solidarity. Lord, help us to hold on to the end of the DVD when we all get to heaven and see you face to face. There is hope in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.